Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending the first of our FY20 series of Spatial IQ uh, User Group Educational Webinars uh, for this fiscal year. We've been developing and hosting these webinars on topics that would be of interest to local governments with the aim of increasing your Spatial IQ. We're excited, very excited about today's topic. Um, we'll be discussing regional connections and how you can apply GIS in analyzing connectivity and societal variables that affect the economic health of your community. Um, we are um, we're happy to have um, the president of AppGeo, Rich Grady, with us today. Uh, Rich has been with AppGeo for over 25 years. He started his career in state government in the 1970s before entering the private sector to do R&D in computer cartography and then to develop and apply mapping and GIS technologies internationally. As well as being president at AppGeo, he performs um, as a subject matter expert on strategic planning and complex implementation projects and serves in several national organizations, including the Transportation Research Board and the National Emergency Number Association, MENA. Um, this uh, presentation today was Rich's brainchild, and he's really uh, pushed David, uh, Michelle, and me to uh, put this together and think out of the box a little bit. So he's going to give us the introduction, and um, we're very excited to have him on board today. Um, David Breeding is a principal at AppGeo and leads our analytics team. David has been with AppGeo for seven years and has extensive experience managing both local government projects and larger commercial engagements. He has expertise with a wide breadth of spatial software and analytics platforms and is happiest when tasked with building compelling data visualizations and statistical insights for our customers. He is a hands-on technical contributor, and I know he had a lot of fun developing the content for today's presentation. Um, Michelle Giorgiani is a senior project manager at AppGeo and the Spatial IQ program manager. Michelle has over 12 years at AppGeo and 18 years of experience in the GIS field with ex extensive experience in local government, project management, analysis, remote sensing applications, and many other projects. And um, I'm Priya Sankalya. A lot of you know me. Um, I'm a project manager here at AppGeo and a member of the Spatial IQ team. I've been with AppGeo for over 10 years, managing a wide variety of projects from data and application development to analytics, uh, with a strong focus on local governments. Um, just to talk a little bit about logistics, um, currently you are all in listen-only mode. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the questions box in the control panel. Um, your go-to webinar control panel has a questions box where you can submit the questions. We will monitor them as we go, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. We hope to get through them all, but if you don't, uh, if we don't, we'll make sure we send a follow-up email with answers to all the questions. And uh, the webinar is being recorded. We will share it along with the slide deck for you to share um, or review. Um, so, just to quickly go over what we're going to talk about today, um, there'll be an introduction to regional connectedness. Uh, we will uh, focus a little bit on regional commuter flow and then um, kind of go a little dive deeper into it, looking at uh, certain communities and how the commuter flow works in them. And then we'll also look at housing density and transit and then talk about future ideas of, I mean, ideas for future analysis. Um, so with that, um, I will pass it on to Rich, who will um, give us an introduction. Thank you, Priya. And hello, everyone. I'm really excited about the educational aspect of these workshops. I was very happy to be invited by Priya to give a brief introduction to today's workshop topic, Regional Connections. I'd like to start by talking about the first law of geography, namely that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. This was put forth in 1969 by the famous Swiss American geographer, Waldo Tobler, who our very own David Weaver, who some of you may know, a founder at AppGeo, he got to meet and work with uh, Tobler in the 1970s at UCAL Santa Barbara after he graduated from Clark. It's a small connected world, right? 1969 was 50 years ago, the year of Woodstock, 
and the year Jack and Laura Dangerman started ESRI. Even in the internet age and the so-called global village, the first law of geography still resonates. In fact, near not only refers to things that are physically close, but also to things that are closely connected or related or close in interest. The notion of a global village was coined by Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian philosopher in the 1960s in the context of telecommunications and satellites shrinking the world by making it more connected. The internet was a more recent phenomenon in this regard, but the impact of it was foreseen by McLuhan. Here he is in a cameo appearance in Woody Allen's Annie Hall movie. That's Woody at the center of the photo. The basic premise of, of today's workshop on regional connections is that connections provide opportunities. The period from 1815 to 1848 was a time of transformation in small town New England. And as examined in Mary Ferrer's recent book, published in 2016, A Crisis of Community about Boylston, Massachusetts, this uh, book covered both the internal and external influences on change and the actions and motivations of individuals to improve the opportunity presented to them. Prior to 1815, the town of Boylston was actually pretty isolated. A trip to Boston was a two-day ordeal over poor roads on horseback or stagecoach. By 1835, it was a two-hour trip on the train. About the same as today. <laughs> well, only kidding, sort of. Worcester to Boston is about an hour and a half on the commuter rail, but two hours is not unusual. But back to improve the opportunity. I really like that phrase, which the author attributes to Mary White, a resident of Boylston at the time of the book. She kept a diary full of keen observations covering uh, the period of the book. And she was a shopkeeper along with her husband and would hear and share a lot of news in the shop. The bottom line is that no town is an island and you can improve the opportunity for yourself and others in your town by understanding regional connections and the flow and movement of people, goods, and ideas between places. Part of what we're going to show and talk about today are the movements between places in New England. But let's take a brief look at this amazing example of a flow map from 150 years ago. It was created by Charles Joseph Menard, a French civil engineer, to show Napoleon's disastrous Russian campaign. The actual campaign was in 1812. This map, uh, which is also a statistical graph, shows where Napoleon's troops crossed the Neiman River in Lithuania on their path to Moscow and back. The width of the path shows the size of the army at each place along the way. You can see how it gets thinner and thinner as troops continue to die or desert the dire circumstances, freezing weather, extreme lack of food, getting picked off by Russian peasants, peasants and Cossacks. And the path of the treat is linked graphically to the temperature scale and dates at the bottom of the map, an amazing example of multivariate data representation. If someone could produce something such as this 150 years ago with pen, ink, paper, and a ruler, and no precedent of similar technique, what should we be able to do today with cloud computing, GIS, statistical analysis software, and lots of good examples to learn from? Documentary, you know. Well, our speaker, David Breeding, will give us a taste of what can be done with a look at commutes and flows between places in the current era. David? Hello. Can everyone hear me now? Apologies about that. Um, and, and thank you, Rich. I'm just going to share my screen. David, three hours later. Hello. OK. 
can you change my presenter? All right, apologies everyone. All right, here we are. So getting right into it, um, I hope to do better um, then uh, I hope to improve upon and show some of the, the visualization techniques that we have available to us today, um, kind of looking at the connections that we're making daily um, as we move to and fro between um, various locations throughout the, the Northeast. Uh, the U.S. has been, um, or the Census Bureau has been collecting data on commute uh, information since the 60s. And today we have access to hundreds of millions of rows of data. And, and we're going to start taking a look at some of that and see what it can tell us. Traditionally, research projects begin with a question. And, and then we search for data that begins to try and address those questions. But we're going to kind of flip that on its head today, which is not abnormal in a, in a day when data is readily available. And look from the other direction. Take the commute data and, and start to see what it has um, mm -hmm. in it and what it, can, what it can start to show us. As a starting point, this commute data is national. Um, the census data has it, you know, has been collecting it since the 60s, as I mentioned, and the American Community Survey took on those questions in, in 2005. Um, this is what it looks like for 327 million people moving between locations every day. Um, we have excluded long haul truckers because they make for a messy visualization, but these are commutes that are up to 100 miles or 160 kilometers. Um, and, and I think this uh, clearly communicates um, you know, these flows. And, and it's an opportunity to kind of ask additional questions um, and, and kind of get into, you know, what we can learn about this. Um, today we're going to focus on primarily publicly available data, you know, the American Community Surrey as, as one example. But I think it should be noted that there's a massive market for location data and it's growing every day and is ready to be tapped. Um, to give you a feel for the scale, the, the New York Times reported at the beginning of 2019 that it, the individuals, on average, individuals' exact locations are being captured up to 14,000 times daily via various applications and other mechanisms. And the market for this data in the ad world is growing to $21 billion. Um, you know, more specifically, we've worked with TomTom. Um, as, a, as a company that is also aggregating and collecting data, and, and they have even more granular data into these flows um, where, where users are going to and from. And just to give you a, an idea that there is more granularity out there to this data than what we're looking at today. Um, but, you know, I think the message that we can distill from all of this is that we should really be thinking about how our data is shared as data creators, but also realize that there is so much value out there for us to kind of create. And, and, and that's what I kind of want to show today. Um, and so when we started this project, when we had this big idea, we were looking around for well, what data is available and quickly landed upon the ACS, but also were introduced to these group of researchers, um, Garrett, Garrett Dash Nelson out of Dartmouth at the time, now at the Boston Public Library, and also Aldser Ray, who is from the University of, of Sheffield. What they did was do the hard work of sometimes getting into the data and getting their hands dirty. There are 1.4 million census track to census track connections that are stored in that census data, and they went through the process of mapping them all, organizing them, and then thought and asked the question, well, what does this data tell us? And what they wanted to try and do is find a mathematical approach to kind of aggregating these commutes to define how we really live and exist um, in, in, the, in the United States or in the nation. I, I you know, recommend everyone go take a look. It's really interesting data, and it is what we're going to be using today. They did that hard work, and so it's, it's out there. There's lots of data available, and this is just one example um, of the data that's available. Specifically, their data came from the uh, five-year estimates from 2006 to 2012, um, and we worked with that data. Um, you know, as I mentioned, because we wanted to get started. We want to get into the, you know, trying to find what those questions are. Um, I've mentioned some of these other things, but as a background, a census track is a unit of geography, which, you know, roughly has, they're trying to shoot for 4,000 individuals, um, but they can range between 1,000 to 8,000 people. So just as an, as an example of, um, just for some context, what we're looking at today. Data comes from many sources. This is an example of MassDOT showing some flows regionally. Um, their data and their numbers will differ from what the census has. Um, but again, to, to that upper, that, that higher level message, there's lots of information out there to tap and, um, and lots of opportunities to drill in where your particular area of focus is. But 
getting into the data, um, how, do, how can we work with this data? How do we make sense of all these flows? Um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and jump into a visualization platform called Cardo. And uh, we're gonna kinda look at, at least at a regional level at this point in time, um, some of this, this information. So bear with me one sec. All right, so here we are. Um, so right now we have some, uh, oh, actually we wanna go, apologies. Without any style, this is the this is what the data looks like. How can we make sense of this? What is it showing us? Um, how you start with this is well, well, we have some options to work with. We can symbolize our data, we can simplify our data, and we can filter our data. And so we're going to go through some of those techniques just at a high level and and kind of see what what some of the the styling can do for us. Right now, we basically took the track point um, origins to track point destinations and are styling the lines between them. Um, the darker lines showing larger flows of commuters, the lighter lines showing less flow of commuters. But again, you know, getting a feel for these volumes, but even with this additional context, it's still difficult to kind of make sense of what's going on here. It's, it's a little bit too much. So that's kind of, let's think about how we could aggregate, how we could simplify this view by just looking at the destination points. So I just took the destinations where all these lines are flowing to and did again another symbolic, another styling technique looking at that flow of individual commuters. Um, as we can see, you can start to get a feel for where those, those uh, big poles, those, those, uh, those destinations are. Again, these are all census track centroids if, if those, for those that are familiar with the underlying data. But you know, this, is, this is just one way to kind of continue to make sense of what this, what this data contains. But really the power that we've found, at least in our investigation, is when you start to filter down the data, when you can start to ask specific questions of it. And we did a little bit of work to kind of append additional data elements um, to it, but let's take a look at what happens when we start to actually filter on um, some of these details. Right now, I'm gonna zoom back out, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna set some, uh, some filters um, to begin with. Let's look at just those, um, those destinations that have high, high volumes of, uh, of flow. One sec. Okay. So right now, we're starting to see some of those flows um, aggregating around where people are, are flowing to. And let's further refine that. And let's look at just where some specific destinations of interest. So as we can see, um, there's some big, big drivers going on here. There's some, some pull, some large pull that's, that's kind of drawing um, users to these various locations. But how about interconnections between them? We wanna see the, the, the connectedness between these various locations. So for, for that particular example, we can start to look at both that, this commute destination as well as the commute origin. So I'm gonna scroll down here and start to see if we can pull out and, and understand maybe a little bit more about how these, these two um, regional kind of groups are pulling. And we'll notice interestingly that, you know, Rhode Island seems to have a tighter connection with Boston than the Worcester area. You know, and that starts to beg the questions, well, what about those, those particular um, cities is, is kind of getting in the way of some of these connections? Um, could it potentially be related to, to kind of rail opportunities? Um, is, what if there was a better option for this connection? But still at a high level, um, you know, we can start to ask these questions. Where are we passing through? Where are these commuters, um, you know, along their line of travel. And again, this is just point to point and not along a roadway, but how can we use this information to, to understand and make decisions about the commuter's needs or the business opportunities that might be, uh, you know, potentially available to these, uh, to take advantage of. Um, one thing that's that also to note is in the community survey, we are looking at all modes of travel. Um, at the track level, they don't have that mode broken out in the data. Um, but so there could, you know, so it does require a little bit of um, outside the box thinking and, and, and there's also more granular data available from the census coming from the, a longitudinal employment study. Um, and I've included in the slide deck uh, some additional details about that that we'll make available. Um, but there's lots of ways to look at this and Michelle will really kind of dive in um, to some of these additional these additional filtered opportunities and, and get into some of those questions um, that that are available to be explored. 
But I think just from a high level, you know, we have that as I, as I started out, distance travel being a, a major element of how you can think about the flow, whether it's the high volume trips or the low. Um, there's, there's also, whether it's in, in state or out of state, you know, maybe we're only interested in, in kind of looking at that where that travel is, where the origin's coming from inside Massachusetts or inside Connecticut, for example. So thinking about those origins and, and being able to filter on that um, using that particular data element. Or maybe it's the population who really want to work and relate to those, those cities and towns that have lots of massive population centers and really focus on where the biggest flows are. So, um, or, or maybe it's even kind of how do we work within our own community of, of users and look at the connections between various map geo towns and how maybe there's some tight relationships and, and data that sharing that could be possible between um, these potential uh, cities and, and communities. But without stealing, um, trying not to steal any of uh, Michelle's thunder, I think we want to kind of dive in now at this point and take a look at some of those local examples, focus on some more um, municipal uh, areas of interest, and uh, and just kind of drill into what are those those other questions that we can be asking. Um, so yeah, we just flip on over to Michelle. All right, Michelle, you should have control. It would help if I unmuted myself. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, all right, so we've looked at regional connectedness now through the context of the commuter flow um, at a regional level and explored the data sources available. Um, now we're gonna look at it at a more local level through the lens of three municipal examples. So we picked these three examples um, for these reasons. First, we wanted to see if there was anything to learn about being near a state boundary where there's potential for people to travel across the boundaries. In the case of North Attleboro, it's at the Rhode Island and Massachusetts boundary. Um, we also wanted to explore if proximity to transit, such as rail and highways, seem to correlate with the amount of commuter flow to a particular location. All three of our example towns fit this criterion. Also, North Attleboro has qualified opportunity zones, which serves to entice more business to the town. So that's one of the reasons we picked that town. Um, and in general, general, we were looking for a nice distribution across the tri-state area to showcase some local examples to you because you are our local customers and our local audience for this webinar. Um, plus, I thought it was cool that they all started with the word north because we all need some direction in life. Ha ha ha. All right, I'm gonna actually switch over into the Cardo platform that David was just in and look at the data itself. Let's start with travel distance in general. So how far are people traveling to get to these places, these three towns for work? We'll look back at that origin to destination um, line data that David was showing us. And we can see that by looking at this travel distance metric here, that the largest amount of commutes is happening within 50 miles of their destination. So I can filter on this first, this first two larger groups here um, to get around 50 miles distance. Um, but on the flip side, um, there's a much smaller amount coming from further away. So I'll show that if I swap the filter there. All right, so now this is filtered to show the, um, the smaller amounts coming from further away. So if we look down here at North Haven, um, they have people coming all the way from Southern Rhode Island and Springfield, Massachusetts. So those that are coming from further away are clearly leveraging the variety of transit options such as rail and highway. Let's look at the rail lines. So these commuters could be taking these um, train rides from South Kingstown over there or they could be coming down um, this this rail line through central Connecticut or you know they could be driving interstates 95 and 91. Um, but an obvious observation is that having rail line accessible um, potentially brings in more people. 
So maybe having a bus or a shuttle service from the train stations that go around town to drop off these commuters at their places of work um, would make it a much more desirable mode of commuting. And that could bring in more people to town, which means more potential consumer spending in town. All right, let's go over to North Attleboro. I'm gonna switch views here. So this is the same data um, filtered to look at just the flow going to North Attleboro. And I also have drive time rings turned on. So a quick visual here shows that there's a large number of commuters coming from, from within 30 minutes drive. These blue areas here are 30 minutes. So all the lines within that are coming from 30, minute, 30 minutes. So there's a lot of towns within this region. So there's a lot of people coming from nearby within 30 minutes from a variety of towns. Um, but many are indeed coming from further away, but mostly from within an hour. The, the light pink on the outside is, is one hour or 60 minutes um, drive time. And this is likely due to the availability of several major highways accessible to North Attleboro and the towns around it. Let me turn off the drive time here so we can see the highways. So there's a lot of highways. Um, and there's also a commuter rail that goes from Boston through North Attleboro as well into Rhode Island. But now let's explore that cross-boundary concept. So there's any interesting patterns with commuters coming from Rhode Island. There we go. So if I scroll up here, I can see when this link um, that we have 1,740 people commuting from Rhode Island to North Attleboro. Well, what distance is most common to commute from Rhode Island? This first travel distance group here shows that there's a high number of commutes coming from a shorter distance. Oops, wrong one. There we go. All right, so now I have that just that bucket selected of the higher commutes, but I want to see a further breakdown of that, so I can zoom in to that group there, and it shows the distribution of the commute distances within that first group. So maybe this could reveal for us what's in the range of alternative modes of travel, like bicycle riding or electric bikes. So maybe collaborating with some e-bike companies would entice more commuters. But regardless, it looks like most are coming from within 26 miles. Um, but where are most people coming from when they travel from Rhode Island to North Attleboro? Well, we can see on the map that it looks like um, most are coming from southwest of North Attleboro, whereas more urban areas like Pawtucket and Central Falls and Providence, and there's likely more access to buses and ride shares and in general, more housing and more people. And we might ask then, well, what's making it harder to come from here, from the West? Well, having grown up there in Cumberland, I know that it's much more rural in comparison. There's suburban towns and lower population density to the West and not likely um, as much or no public transportation options. So how would North Attleboro or even the surrounding towns help improve that flow? Maybe this data can help reveal some patterns to help the towns focus. Towns like North Attleboro are using the opportunity zones for increasing the business opportunities to bring in more revenue. And commuting information like this could be helpful for planning for those um, opportunities and the potential increase in businesses and employees. All right, let's go over to the third town, um, Northboro, and look at their situation. So we have some folks coming from pretty far away. They're going from Haverhill, Haverhill and Lawrence. Um, they're most likely traveling by Interstate 495, zipping down that. But then there's also folks coming from Boston doing the reverse commute. Um, maybe, maybe some of them are coming from this rail, commuter rail. But let's look more at the origin towns. We can see in the visual here that there are many commuter flow lines originating from Worcester. But this origin town filter here um, can also show us that. So let's apply a filter on Worcester.
All right, we can see that the total flow of commuters coming from Worcester going to Northborough is 1,130 people, which is approximately 22% of all commuters to Northborough. Well, there are a lot of people in Worcester, and it's relatively easy commute um, by these highways here, I-90 and, and 290. Um, but let's flip this on its side now. So far, I've been talking about only people commuting into these towns, but where are the people going to when they leave the town? So now we're looking at a filtered view of the commuter flow lines where the origin town is Northborough. So these lines are going the other direction, out away from North, Northborough. In total, there's 5,280 people coming from Northborough. So one, one of these lines that I found really interesting is this one in the southwest here that's going from Northborough all the way down to Camden, Connecticut. And there are 25 commuters traveling that. I have no idea why. I really wonder why. What's in Hamden that's such a draw to make people commute that far away? I mapped it and it's almost a two hour drive. But based on the numbers here, the commute lines with the highest volumes of commuters leaving Northborough are traveling nearby. And we can see that here in this flow volume filter. So I filter on just these, the second and third groups here and zoom in to that data. <clears throat> so this is showing us just the higher volume commutes from Northborough. Maybe this type of information could be used to see what kind of an impact on a large volume of commutes would be. Say if there's new construction project on the main route out to Marlboro. Um, and this commute, commuter flow, there's 250 commuters going to Marlboro. That's quite a lot to be affected. Um, but we could also look too at what's going on with the neighboring towns around the town. Let's switch to that view here. So this is filtered just to show the flow lines leaving Northborough and going to an adjacent town. There's 1,920 or roughly 36% of commuters going to an adjacent town for work from Northborough. Maybe this information could be used to make decisions on where to make improvements to their commutes and make them better or safer to attract more opportunities, Northborough and the surrounding towns. Finally, we could ask, well, how many people are actually staying in Northborough? So this view here is filtered to show just the flow of commuters that are not leaving Northborough. There's only 600. Um, that's a lot less than those that are going to another town and making those regional connections. All right, so we've looked at the regional connections from a commuter lens, which also involves looking at rail and vehicle travel perspectives. We can also look at it from the perspective of parcel use and housing density, which is what Priya is going to talk about next. I'm going to switch it to you, Priya. Thanks, Michelle. Um, let me just put it in too. So um, in New England today, uh, we're facing a housing crisis and a transportation crisis. Um, there's a lack of affordable housing where the jobs are and our transportation infrastructure is stretched. What are some of the ways we can look for opportunities to alleviate this crisis? A regional perspective helps to put things into context and understand where you stand as a local government in a regional economy. Living close to where you work makes for a better lifestyle and reduces stresses on the transportation system. And there's a need to increase housing close to existing trans transit and conversely explore business opportunities around transit away from Boston where costs are high and the traffic is an issue. We've been looking at some work that has been done by the Mass Housing Partnerships Center for Housing Data and have a different tool to visualize the data. And this is um, kind of going back to the Cardo tool that both um, David and Michelle have been using. Um, and so we mapped parcel use codes around a half a mile from a transit stop to look at patterns and answer some of these questions. So I'm gonna um, just go into the into Cardo again and um, 
show you what this looks like. Um, this is the extent that we looked at, again, the region and all the transit stops, and we um, uh, filtered the data around the transit stops for the parcels within a half a mile. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit to show you what it looks like on that very local level. Um, so here you can see um, we've essentially categorized the use codes into um, these various uh, categories. Uh, low density residential is essentially your single family housing. Um, high, high density residential will be condos and multifamily units. And um, this brown one is uh, parcels with or use codes with business potential. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of variability in uh, how um, parcels are used uh, around transit stops. Just looking at this, you know, two stops that are very close to each other, Reading Highlands and uh, this, the, these Woburn stops, you can see that this one has significant amount of business potential parcels, and this one is all um, a lot of uh, low, de low density residential um, parcels. So, you know, we can look at this data and explore it just on the map, but I think um, sort of using this and asking some questions of it would have been more instructive. So we um, we, we decided to look at this um, data in a different way and actually um, graph it. So I'm going to go into another tool called um, Tableau, which is, um, which, is, which is graphing this data. And what we did was we looked at all the parcels and what the percentage of um, each of these categories is, uh, uh, the, the use code is. And we sort of looked at, asked the questions, what is the percentage of parcels that have, of transit stops that have a low density uh, residential use or a high density residential use? And as you can see, this is um, this is a graph of uh, the low density um, residential, and almost um, seventy percent of the um, of the transit stops have low des density residential around them. And so this is really informative. And I think then you can sort of you know look at each one of these stops and you know go back to the um, um, go back to the map and explore the, the map and uh, and see what those stops are. This is the, the high density residential and you can see that um, it's a very, where it's landing is this really low uh, percentage of um, uh, uh, in the areas around the transit have high de density residential. So this is sort of showing you what the, um, you know, what the uh, lay of the land is as far as the use codes are concerned. So just going back to my uh, presentation, um, I want to just um, uh, okay talk about how um, these this information can then lead to uh, more opportunities for looking at what other you know what are the questions you can ask of this. You can oh, I'm just going to present this. Sorry. Um, so one of the context-driven views could be looking at the stops that have developable opportunities and then also where are the mixed-use um, uh, parcels. And what this gives you is that, you know, it gives you what, how the local governments use the mixed-use uh, parcels and how have they explored that opportunity and made that available or what are the developable opportunities and where are those? And for that, we've essentially looked at, you know, what are the uh, commercial or the developable or the industrial use codes and aggregated those. So these are the kind of questions that you can ask of the data. And also then, if you find that there are all these areas that have um, low des density residential by transit stops, are there any opportunities for uh, changing you, uh, changing the zoning ar around those, and how can we do that? So I think this is how um, we can look at this. Looking at the business potential close to transit, that we find that there are some transit stops that definitely do have a high, um, you know, uh, a business potential. Meanwhile, there are others that do not at all, and there's just, you know, look again, looking at it, is just 10% of them have that um, that. Uh, opportunity. And then mixed use as well is really, really low. I mean, just about, you know, the 2% uh, of the uh, transit stops have mixed use by them. So this is all, these are all the questions that we can be asking of this data. And um, 
uh, there are other potential um, questions like we can aggregate the data by line and see which line of the which which um, a commuter rail line has most of these opportunities. We can overlay demographic information on this and see what is the demographics of these transit stops. What are the land value? Um, there are several state data layers that can also be explored and put together with this and. Um, I think the key thing that we'd like to point out in all of this is that there are several re regional entities that are involved in research like this, and you know they can help you with um, finding these regional connections, making the relationships, and understanding the um, the land uses around you, and how can we explore them from a regional perspective, and make our um, uh, you know the areas where we live and work more livable and uh, helpful to everybody. Um, I think this is um, kind of leads us to what um, you know ideas we can have for further analysis, and I'll hand it over to David to talk about that. Thank you, Priya. Um, we've heard a lot, a lot of ideas today. Uh, we've looked at a, a lot of different um, use cases. We've talked, looked at a lot of different data, but but really, this is just the starting point. This is just an opportunity to start a conversation. You know, oftentimes, when we are presented with new new questions, we really try to dive into the data. But we're hoping that some of the the context that we've shown today, some of this data that we've exposed, might um, really Get you thinking about um, some questions you might have, but you know, for you know, additional ideation, for additional kind of you know, thinking about this, we looked at rail. But how does bus, you know, bus routes, bus stops, the density of them, you know, in your town, if you don't have a rail line available, how does that play um, into the the connectedness of your community or the ways that people flow um, around? You know, we we looked at use codes for for properties, but zoning is another compelling way to think about how how properties can be used or not, and kind of diving in um, to use that in context with your data. We we didn't really show demographic or economic variables in with some of these data, but that's a whole, that's a whole nother um, element, a whole nother consideration when you think about who has the capacity to leverage some of these resources or how they might travel within your within your communities. Um, you know, when we think about you know citizens that are flowing between, you know, what's pulling them, what's pushing them. Um, you know, there are there are other data and other context in the private sphere that can kind of get into those levels of granularity about you know. Are they are they traveling to go buy things? Are they, are they shopping in neighboring towns or not? Um, you know, so there is more opportunity to kind of get insight into why and where people are are flowing. From a property perspective, um, you know, rent and some of the multi-use factors that we looked at today. You know, what are those large demands? Um, how how might this information help kind of drive the growth from a, a property perspective, um, or from an assessing perspective? You, you know, obviously looking at those those property variables and and thinking about how you do comparable analysis, how how you might think about walk scores um, and how you quantify um, for your town how people flow or how how things are connected. So again. Um, we are really excited about working with our communities that are involved in the Spatial IQ program and, and want to hear what you're thinking about. Um, and we want to bring our experience uh, to you and to support a conversation. So we love doing this stuff. Um, I had a great time doing this, working with all my colleagues, and I hope we get to work with you um, on some of these, these uh, challenges. At this point, um, we can open this up for questions. There's a, a chat kind of component of the, the GoToWebinar um, platform. So please um, pop in some questions if you haven't already. And uh, we'll kind of, right now, I know Michelle's been looking at the questions throughout the presentation, and we're kind of I'm going to organize that. Um, so I'm going to kind of let it just uh, shift it over to Michelle, and so she can kind of feed us in um, some of those questions. Sure. Thanks, David. So we get a couple questions, and I think um, you hit on some of them, but maybe you might have a little bit more to elaborate um, on. So yeah. the first question wanted to know about the um, the application that we were using for demoing. And mm -hmm. Yeah, no, happy to, to chat a little bit about it. I know. The data. Yeah, totally, totally happy to kind of chat about 
you know, uh, it's a Cardo. Cardo is the, the name of the company. They um, have a really compelling uh, resource that's called, you were looking at Builder is the kind of uh, user interface that we were working in. And, um, you know, oftentimes they, they have an easy way to kind of get in and, and start working with, with their data. Uh, are working with their platform, so there's trials that are readily available. But you know, we just scratched the surface on the filtering components. They have analytical components as well that can help you do some some more um, focused drive time analysis. Um, there are a variety of other tools in which you can blend or or kind of join data together. But um, we'd be happy to kind of you know talk about starting that journey as uh, and, you know or talking about that resource more in the context of how does it answer your questions. And you know, these tools are great. And they, they help kind of expose interesting relationships, but really it's all about creating value. And so that's where we often start when we, you know, before we get into tools, but happy to chat more. Great, thanks. Um, the next question was, um, could you overlay demographic data and use that in the analyses that you were showing? Yeah. Um, Definitely. You know, one of the things about the, the ACS data and the aggregation to tract, census tract, is they have a direct comparison to, you know, some of those demographic and economic variables, um, looking at, you know, you know, disadvantaged communities, you know, looking at median household income, um, looking at education, you know, looking at, yeah, you know, whatever the factor may be that, um, might shed light on the question that you're trying to ask. So in short, yes, you know, layering, laying that data together is, is, a, is one step. Um, there's also intersecting it and doing, working with it from a data perspective. So we kind of blend that and do analysis or maybe make that a filter because now we can filter those commute lines from origins that have particular demographic or economic variables, which will shed a whole new kind of perspective on the flow. So um, that, is, that is a really good next step. Okay, and the final question was, what year was the commuter from that you showed? Yeah, um, I think I had it in, in the slide, but um, it's from uh, 2006 to 2012. However, you know, there is a more current data. You know, the, the latest five-year estimate, I believe, that's been published is out to 2017. Um, so again, you know, this is a very repeatable kind of process. Um, and there are other units of aggregation, you know, county, you know, brings that mode, you know, tr transportation mode um, to bear. You can start to um, see some of that, that information. I know just quickly jumping back up, um, if we look at the questions themselves, um, you know, it's, it's kind of illustrative to, to what, what's available, right? And they're just the census to protect um, the privacy of the respondents. They make these available at different levels of aggregation. So um, at census tract, you're kind of limited to that flow, which is what we looked at, but there might be some more regional or, or some more um, county level uh, you know, information to kind of dig into. So yeah, 2006 to 2012 is what we were working with for this, for the visualizations you saw today. Um, that's all the questions we have for now. Um, head back down and and hand it to Priya to wrap this up. All right. Uh, we, or I'm happy. You know, I I just appreciate. Um, we'll just head back down to the the bottom. Sorry about that. Ooh, zipping along. Um. Yeah. So here we. I don't know, Priya, if you want to. Well. I can just do a summary real quick. You know, we, we really see there, there being good value from looking regionally and looking at connections. Um, as I mentioned, there are lots of data sets available to explore. We're familiar with lots of them. We can bring them to bear to help, help you do your exploration. Um, we just really want to have that conversation. Um, you know, this was just some examples to kind of start thinking about um, what's available. But, you know, we're here to help raise your spatial IQ. We're always re ready to have a call. And, and we just, we think there's lots of opportunity when we think about commutes to help you solve your problems and can connect you with other communities and other data sets within the MapGeo community that might really help you look at the relationships between these various connections. Um, and I think, Oh, and and please, you know, share share this um this data with your planners. We'll send along the the presentation as as one component. But we're we're also going to look at this data, and and we are going to tailor it to those that joined us today. We see, you know, there's some representatives from from Acton and Manchester and and North Andover and others. So we're going to put 
put together just your focused town view and, and send along a Cardo link. So you can start to play with the data in the same way that we were playing with it today. And so hopefully that'll help further um, allow you to engage and start asking your own questions. But again, thank you for your attendance and attention, and we look forward to hearing from you.